This is off planet radio. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Emily Moyer. Randy is off today, but I am here with a fabulous guest who we have not talked to in a long time. And uh, he's here, not fresh off of, but off of his recent tour and uh, covering a lot of interesting current topics. We're going to talk about 5G. We're going to talk about Jeffrey Epstein, uh, QAnon nonsense, and the current state of freedom in the United States and around the world. So my favorite meditative belligerent, Derek Rose, welcome back to Off Planet Radio. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. It's always good to talk with you. Yeah, absolutely. So you've been a very, very busy man. Um, it's interesting. You kind of, you know, you'll put out a lot of content for a while and then pull back for a bit. And that's kind of, you know, so I kind of am able to track what you're doing, but I kind of hopped back on the, the Derek Bros train like a little bit back when you were doing some really good coverage of the 5G coming online in Houston. And so I kind of wanted to start there and then we'll work our way through some of the other topics. You had, a, I think, a very effective appearance at the city council was it a city council meeting in houston that you were that you were talking at yeah well it was city council yeah i mean i've watched lots of people go and they just sort of you know drone on and on and complain and do all this fear stuff and the people in the city council don't listen and just move on to the next topic you actually seem to even though it was still it was just for a few minutes sort of penetrate a little bit there with with a couple of the people in the council. So can you tell people what's been going on in Houston with this 5G release and, and the state of the activism around that? Uh, I, sure. Yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna go ahead and assume that you've talked about this with your audience before and that we don't have to start at the beginning of what 5G is. So I'll just yeah. go forward with that assumption. Um, so in Houston though, Houston is one of the first chosen cities to be like the, the rollout cities for the 5G network along with LA, Sacramento, a couple other major cities. Verizon chose them. And uh, you mentioned my tour. I'd been on tour. And it's also funny to me that, that I was, I've been curious, like if anybody noticed my output kind of ebbs and flows based on how busy I am in the real world. Like if I'm doing a tour, obviously I'm not at home working on content every day, but when I'm home, I get a lot of ideas for things I want to talk about and put out. So I just get, I try to just, you know, put out as much as I can. But when I came home from the tour, I started to think like, what can I do here in Houston, you know, which is where I live? How can I get back involved locally? What are the issues going on? And I just, you know, the universe worked out the way it does. And I happened to get home from tour the same, like I think two days before the city of Houston, the mayor and uh, the head of Verizon were having a press conference announcing the world's first 5G customer. And they had this big press conference and they, you know, I get the... Here's a tip for any activists out there. Go to your city websites and look up on the press section. And there's usually a, a section where you can sign up to get emails about city council, about uh, the police, about fire department, about any city department you want. And there's a lot of interesting information that might be helpful for different things. So I get, you know, I get the details on where the mayor is going to be at and what his schedule is and things like that. And so I saw that there was this press event going on announcing the first 5G customer and decided, well, you know what? I keep hearing people talk about 5G. I, I've looked into it a little bit, but I hadn't to the extent that I have now. This was back in um, early, end of September, early October. And uh, I went to this, this event and it was like most of my experiences here in the city, doing journalism, going to police press conferences and to <laughs> city council press conferences. It's all a show. I mean, it's there's really no other way to put it. It's a show that like, I'm in there with my, you know, little DSLR camera and they've got this big fancy equipment and, you know, all their, all their devices and their street, you know, they're broadcasting from big corporate companies and none of them ask any questions. It's generally like the mayor or the, the police chief will go up there and they'll announce, well, we had this many arrests this week or the mayor, uh, you know, cut a ribbon at this new library or just whatever fluff piece is going on this week. And then everybody poses for pictures and, you know, yada, yada, yada. So that's kind of what this thing was like. I go there and we're inside this young couple's house and this they are the ideal smart house. I mean, like they had every smart device you can think of in their house. They had just bought it because they knew they were about to get 5G. So they wanted to make sure their whole house was outfitted with, you know, Alexa, Google Home, this, this, you know, all the listening devices and watching devices. And um, so they had all the press come there and the mayor and 
the head of Verizon just pat each other on the back about how great 5G is and how awesome they have been. And while I was there, I was able to talk to the to the couple and say, hey, you know, I'm, I do journalism here in the city. If you've never heard about health or privacy concerns, here's my card, you know, reach out to me. They haven't reached out so far, but hopefully they will at some point. And uh, anyways, I, I, I used that op opportunity while I was waiting in line patiently for the local news to ask the mayor their softball questions. And while the mayor's going on about how excited he is that Houston gets to be the first one, that New York can't say that they're first. Uh, Chicago can't say they're first, but Houston can, you know, Houston pride and all this just, uh, it just makes me throw up in my mouth. Like this kind of, you know, I think nobody at, at these events, nobody ever actually asks any questions and rocks the boat because they want access because they want to get invited to all the mayor's gala dinners and, you know, uh, press events. But if you, you know, ask too many hard questions, you're going to get told you're not allowed to come back. So it, it's just, it makes me sick. All these people just surrounding him and, and the head of Verizon and nobody's, you know, thinking anything really. Um, and I use that as an opportunity to ask him about, but ask both of them about the health concerns and the privacy concerns, and both of them claimed to have no knowledge of either. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the beginning. Those videos started to get attention, and I realized, well, I hadn't been to Houston City Council in a while. It's kind of one of my favorite ways to uh, harass or to interrogate the the status in charge of the city. Because just to make it clear to anybody who's seen the videos, I have no, I don't go there with any expectation that they're actually going to hear me out, and all of a sudden there's going to be a vote, and you know. 5G or whatever topic. I've gone in the past about police brutality, fluoride, um, stingray surveillance. Stingray, I mean, yeah. I've gone, you know, for the last nine years in Houston to city council for various things. And I've had enough experience with this mayor and the last mayor and all the city council members to know how things usually go. And uh, so I, I didn't go there with that, that expectation. I went there specifically because I know that they film the city council events and I know how to rip those off of their city's website and then load them on YouTube and then get a lot more views and, and use it as a propaganda piece, essentially and get people to actually pay attention. Um, and then use my ability, I guess, to focus and remember facts and speak well to mm -hmm. actually show who's educated in the room. And I think it becomes pretty clear when people watch the videos. So yeah, I, I did those couple of videos there um, confronting the CEO of Verizon and the mayor. And then I went to the first city council video, which is the one I think you're probably referring to because I've actually been, uh, I went yesterday for the fourth time and I'm actually, there's a video rendering right now, which by the time this interview is out, it'll be up on my YouTube channel, it's, which I think people will be interested to see. But the first one um, with, I don't know if somebody with a big following shared it or what happened, but in the last couple of days, it went from... 6,000 views to 70,000 views. So wow. people seem very concerned with what's going on with 5G, and particularly that, that video. Um, people do have a lot of support and say, wow, he's very well-spoken and these kinds of things. Uh, and I want to say this to uh, other people in some of the comments, and I've got this over the years for a variety of things. There's people saying, um, well, maybe they would have taken him more seriously if he didn't wear shorts. Because if you notice in the video, I, wear, I was wearing shorts. Like, I, <laughs> Honestly, I... I sort of did that. I did it because that's what I was wearing at the time. But at the same time, I was conscious of like, well, should I change or do this? And I'm like, no, you know what I mean? Like I live where I live. I live a 15, 20 minute bike ride from downtown. Like I can see downtown from my house. So to me, this is an hour and a half at most out of my day. I'm sitting here at my house doing my research, going about business. So I'm like, okay, time for city council. Ride my bike downtown, wipe the sweat off my brow, go inside, listen to them do their status BS, go up there, speak to them for two, three, maybe four or five minutes and then walk out. And then ride my bike back home, go back about my business, wait the next day for that video to get loaded and throw it on the internet and see what happens. Like, I don't take these people seriously. And people are like, these are public servants. You should, you know, this is like a courtroom. I'm like, okay, don't give them that much respect. Like I respect them as human <laughs> beings, but they have proven through their actions and they're proving again with 5G, unfortunately, that they don't care. Um, however, though, as I said, there was four videos. Most people have only seen that first video. And in the first video, it does seem like they care. They've kind of put up that uh, appearance. The main guy who actually asked questions, his name's Jack Christie. He's actually a chiropractor and uh, some other kind of doctor, I can't remember. And he is also a city council member. He's the only one that stood up and tried to help us with fluoride, with tried to help us with, you know, a lot of different, anything health related, we can pretty much count on him. Like whenever the uh, Andrew Wakefield and Del Bigtree were screening their documentary Vaxxed a couple years ago, and they yeah. had they had a screening in Houston. Jack Christie, that same council member, he actually came to the screening. And I did an interview with him on um, one of my YouTube channels that you can see. And he's, you know, he's against vaccinations, or at least he's like, hey, we need to slow down the schedule and, and you know, not just rush forward. And obviously, as you can expect, that got him a lot of shit locally from, you know, all kinds of people. So 
he's but when it comes to health generally he, he'll stand up and, and say something now on other issues he's not so good <laughs> that's kind of how they tend to be but yeah. um i knew that he would at least say something and he he gave me an opportunity by asking a question because what they yeah. but those some of the people i've noticed in the comments they've maybe never been to a city council meeting but generally you know they only give you one you have to sign up for one minutes two minutes or three minutes and they're very quick about like all right your time's up they'll ring a little bell or they'll just tell you and if they don't have anything to say if nobody wants to ask any questions you just got to walk away which is a very defeating feeling for people who i see people you know they're waiting for maybe an hour like yesterday at city council i was there for literally two and a half hours to speak for four minutes you know what i mean like it's but i do it because it's worth it to me but there are people taking off work and driving across the city like who don't live as close you know there's a lot of effort people make and they have their little piece of paper they've taken time to print something out or write something down and they go up there and they say it and then the city council just is either talking amongst themselves not even listening or just as soon as the person's done they're like thank you have a nice day next you know there's people i mean you just go to any city council meeting and i advise somebody because even if you don't have faith in city council it's a good opportunity to meet people because people go up there at least in a city like houston yesterday there was people talking about getting kicked out of their home from you know some fraud there was you know police brutality stuff there's homeless issue you know people come up there for a lot of different things it's an opportunity i reached out to one of the guys and said hey would you want to come on my radio program to talk about the issue that you're expressing because this is something i had never heard about you know what i mean so my point in saying all that is that city council typically doesn't care but it still can be a worth uh, worthy effort for other reasons and so that first city council visit i got a couple of questions i've been emailing them i've been calling them so, and so what they, you were saying is by him asking you a question, it allowed you to have a few more minutes to speak. Yeah, exactly. He, basically, yeah, that's what yeah. I was saying. Is he, he, yeah. gave me, he, he gave me a, a, a leg up, and he knew he was doing that. And I can pretty much count, talk, you know, count on him always to do that. I actually talked to him privately outside of city council yesterday mm. and um, was just saying, like, you know, because this is just the reality of the situation. Again, people saw the first video and like, wow, city council. I'm, I'm even reading the, the YouTube comments this morning. People are like, wow, city council, it actually cares. And I make sure to go tell them, please watch the other videos. This is two months ago. See how they've been acting since then. The second visit, I was met with silence. Mm -hmm. I said my spiel. I brought more studies, more information, more details. Because 5G is just so current and relevant right now that anytime you search it online, you're, there's new news. And so every week I have literally something new to bring to them. Like, hey, look. Here's a senator talking about this. Hey, here's a doctor talking about this, you know? So I'm just trying to drill at home and just keep beating it down on, on them. And second visit though, thank you. Have a nice day. You know, that was it. Yeah. Third visit, um, I also the same thing. I think I got one question, but I basically, the third visit, I decided to kind of take a different angle and all these videos are up on the Conscious Resistance YouTube channel. And I basically, I, I looked at where the cameras were at in the city council and I was like, okay, well, they don't care. So I'm just going to address the people who are watching this, you know? And so I'd said something along those lines, like, I know you guys don't seem to care. So if you're listening, if you hear this, you know, start emailing these people, start calling them. And we kind of started like a public campaign to get people to email them, call them, which has been successful for me in the past, as far as putting pressure, because even in a city with 4 million people like Houston, they don't usually get 10 emails from people who yeah. you know, care about something like right? so if they get 20 30 emails on one topic they're like whoa oh my god like you know maybe we should pay attention people care here so it's kind of it's it's not that difficult to put some pressure on them whether or not that's going to lead to the results we want is a whole nother story but so we started having people email them and, and call them and, and just putting pressure on them and i've people have shown me the responses so they are getting them they are reading some of them and uh we'll see where that goes and i was actually able to reach out to a local uh, a local, I mean, he's a sort of investigative journalist. Sometimes he can be, uh, he, he's a, he's the Fox news reporter here in the city. And he has like his own show called the Isaiah factors named Isaiah Carey. And he's kind of like, like in some ways, at some points he has been like a local Ben Swan, but to a much, much lesser degree. And you know, yeah. in the sense that he'll go out there and like kind of interrogate somebody who's ripping off an old lady or something like that, you know? So I reached out to him and said, Hey, have you heard about this? Here's my city council visits. And he actually had me on Fox news uh, in the, in the city. And uh, I was able to go on there and just repeat the same talking points. I think we had about an eight minute segment and interesting, just brief story on this is whenever I was invited, when he reached out to me, invited me to come to the Fox studios, we filmed on like a Wednesday and it was during some sports ball championship and he was like if the game's on tonight it's gonna it'll be you know the next day it'll be the next day he's like but if it doesn't air this week 
I'll reach out to you and we'll film again. So that was Thursday, Friday. It didn't air. So I was like, okay. So I kept texting him and emailing him asking him, like, is that going to, do you know when that's going to come on or what's going on with that? Uh, it would really be helpful. You know, I was just starting to worry. And I, I definitely do get, I don't want to say paranoid, but very aware of just the pressure. And like, like I said, I've confronted the mayors. I've put pressure on the mayor. I've made it call the mayor out publicly for his ties to Verizon. And back in September, the mayor of Houston was awarded the 5G Wireless Champion Award by the CTIA. The CTIA is the cell, they have a bunch of different names, but they're Cellular Telephone and Internet Association, basically. So mm -hmm. it's a wireless. They're a, a lobbying group for all the wireless companies, big tech, big wireless companies. And they awarded the mayor the 5G Wireless Champion because he's removing all barriers and allowing them to just, you know, rush forward. And so this dude's totally in the pocket of them. And I've made that clear. Um, so I kind of worry, like, are they going to, stop this from airing or are they going to, you know, put pressure on Isaiah Carey, this and that, because I also happened to notice that he had some pictures with him and the mayor together. So I'm like, oh, how much can I really trust this guy? You know what I mean? But ultimately he did air it. He did air the segment about a week later. And thankfully I had a friend, I don't own a TV, but I had a friend who does have TV DVR it, and because they ended up never putting it on their website. Like literally after that, they stopped loading things on their website. And I kept asking them what was going on. Like, cause usually they put it on TV and they would put a clip on their website. So I was like, cool, I'll just get it from there. However, for some reason, the day I was on, they stopped loading clips for a few days. And then when they started loading clips again, they literally skipped the day I was on. Of course. They just kept all the, all the other clips. Well, so it never, because that is the big issue, right? And it's like so easy for people to say, well, it's just a coincidence. Their stuff was down, da, da, da. It's not you. No, it's that. that people don't realize this is the issue. That I was mean, the reason they stopped. It's, like I said, I try not to be like, oh, they're, you know, like just get, because I think as activists, especially when you start, you know, some of the stuff we're going to talk about Epstein and some of the other stuff, there definitely are reasons to like, hey, I need to, you know, watch my, watch my back and just be careful with what, who I'm talking to or where I'm at and to make sure, you know, I'm safe and all these kinds of things. But I do think some people can get a little egocentric and think like they're after me and this yeah. and that. So I try to like, huh. Like, well, that's, 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 serious. The, that's the reason that, that you, I mean, your great strength, Derek, is that, you know, if you were on there and making five, five G people look like who are people are against five G look paranoid and crazy, you wouldn't be effective. The reason you are effective is because you're able to hold your emotions and just have, you know, I know, I know that privately you do have emotions about these things yeah. and you don't like them, but why you're effective is because of that, you know, your ability to just get up there and sort of be zen with it and just talk about it and not, not look crazy and not even seem like you're too much, you know, largely because you don't participate in the political system. You are just a conscious observer, you know, yeah. and so you're able to speak from that spot. And I've actually taken a lot of, um, cues from you on that. And I find I'm able to have much more now that I don't care about politics anymore. And I've mm -hmm. removed myself from it and I'm just observing it. It's very easy, yeah. obvious to see what's going on and to be able to speak more rationally with people about it. And it is just because you sound sane on there that you are dangerous. And so if you were the type that was constantly thinking, oh my God, they're after me and I put out this big thing and it's going to change the world. So they're going to block it and whatever, then they'd love to. And they'd put it all over the place because you'd look like a crazy person, but that's not who you are. So that's what makes you effective. And that's why they're like, we cannot have someone who is this calm, rational, reserved, and sane speaking so just so eloquently about this topic on because people might actually listen. It would be better for to hear, you know, they would love for, much prefer to hear Alex Jones screaming at the top of his lungs about it, right? Yeah, no, I think you're right about that. And I appreciate that. That's, it's, uh, it's definitely a skill that I've had to, to learn over the years. I don't know that it's something that I've always possessed. But and you're right, though, that it's from being a, a, I like how you put that, a conscious observer, from being able to kind of step out of it. Because the people who are like too tied into their emotions of their party or their politician or their, you know, whatever kind of dogma they've fallen into, they can't, I don't know, they get stuck in, in a, in a, in this choice of like, okay, am I going to follow the facts, even though it disagrees with my idol or my dogma, or am I just going to reject it in favor of holding that dogma? And as we know, most people will reject it and, and hold their dogma in place. And I've seen that a lot more recently. And, and I, even on the, the, the thing about 5G and any of this kind of stuff, like I've done this long enough to know that, that, you know, they're coming out of the woodwork and they've already started to get on YouTube. You don't know science. Oh, I bet you think that, you know, um, light bulb, you know, they, they come up with all kinds of crazy things. Like it's just assumption that people who are concerned with technology are just idiots but, that we don't I, understand. Yeah. yeah. We don't understand how technology works. We don't understand radio waves and frequencies. And we're, I mean, it's just this, they, there's a lot of assumption, I think, for some people that 
if you're afraid of these things and we're surrounded by these things already, obviously they're safe. So you must be some kind of backwards, you know, hillbilly who doesn't understand science or something. And I really do try to counter that with the facts and with the information. And like you said, just kind of speaking plainly because it is easy to get frustrated, frustrated. And the video that, that um, I'm uploading today, um, I still remained calm, but I definitely chose this time very consciously be, to just give it straight to the mayor and just call him out. Like that award that I mentioned, I mentioned it. I said, you know, I'd hate to think mayor that because you got awarded this two months ago by this industry that you're refusing to look further into it. And uh, I'll just give you a tip, you know, what he said. He said, I love 5G. That was his response. <laughs> I mean, yeah. like, so, so it's, yeah. it's pretty, it's, it can be overwhelming. It can be frustrating. You know, you're talking about like detaching because I had to detach in a lot of ways. Excuse me, I'm trying to plug in this to make sure it doesn't die. Um, but I had to uh, I had to detach so that I could be able to think clear headed because as I said, like like for example, the Epstein stuff, like whenever I put out the Epstein documentary, if people are Trump supporters, then the one or two minutes where we mention Trump and bring into the facts surrounding the accusations of Trump, then that's all they can focus on and you know, I'm a shill and yada yada yada, or vice versa if I didn't talk enough about the Clintons or, you know, or just, there's yeah. just these things that they, they key in on because of they want to hate this particular person or they want to blame this particular person for everything, or they want to protect this person. That person can possibly not be, you know, you know, responsible for any kind of wrongdoing. So that's just their dogmas that they're stuck in and, and it limits people in so many ways. And I don't really have that when it comes to 5g, like I said, as an observer, I, been talking about it i did i think the first time i really started paying attention to this was back in february i interviewed max egan and he was talking about like mm -hmm. the smart grid as a prison and i definitely was like wow you know he's right about this this is all this stuff's coming and i've been paying attention individually to like facial recognition cameras and to biometrics and all this stuff over the years and you know recently the tsa is announcing they're gonna they've made it clear now all the things that many of us have been saying for years that by 2020, 2021, you will not be able to fly internationally or domestically without getting your face scanned or having some sort of biometric yeah. read. Like that's just, that's a known fact now. The TSA has made it clear in the United States and that freaks me the hell out. You know what I mean? Like, and when I see though, when I started to put the pieces together and realize, okay, so 5G though, when 5G goes live and we have this internet of things with all these different devices and the mayor here in Houston is like, we're gonna have our driverless cars and our robot servants and all this kind of shit. Like when, when you put that all into one big picture, it is the smart prison. I mean, there's really like okay. 5G is going to bring all those things. And I also do think that with the increasing amount of people who have been calling for things like making social media companies, big tech companies, public utilities, or some version of putting the government in control of them in the United States, I think that that is going to be the beginning or some of the early stages of a social credit system in the United mm -hmm. States, because they already have that in China. And just think about the amount of people that are already on Facebook, whether it comes in the form of Facebook or some other app or device or whatever, we are already used to putting, many people are already used to putting their, their lives and everything on, on these social system, these social media systems. So when the integration of 5G comes along and they're like, well, now you have one device or one account for your healthcare, for your medical bills, for your bank account, for your, you know, and they're, they're trying to unify everything into one singular thing. And then eventually we know it'll go to putting it in our hand or in, a, like in our brains, literally. Mm -hmm. But at this point it's like, well, have one device where you can log in to the internet. Cause that's what China has. They have one single, there's only one entry point into the internet so they can track all traffic. You have to get like, and people have talked about that in the United States, having a internet sign on account that everybody would have to log in in order. So then from that point, everything can be monitored, you know, the, you know, from there on. So I feel with all these things converging, we're getting to the point with facial recognition is going to be nationwide by 2021. The upcoming presidential, uh, you know, election, I say upcoming only because we know we're about to start getting coverage of it, unfortunately. And yeah, <laughs> right. if, 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 if the recounts from this election ever end, we'll start getting. Yeah, it. once that's wrapped up, then we'll start <laughs> hearing about next, you know, the next presidential election. But with all those things, 2021, 5G is supposed to be nationwide, 2021 globally even. Um, I don't know. I really, and I don't like to be doomsayer you know I, and i don't i don't think i've necessarily turned into one in my and you know as as far as being pessimistic but you're right as far as putting on a public face and having personal views mm. and my personal view about this is i'm going to keep going to city council i'm going to keep trying to write articles keep trying to use whatever leverage i can to get people in houston and 
elsewhere thinking about things like 5G, but I have absolutely no hope that the people in city council are going to stop it. And as much, I talked to Jack Christie, that's that city council member that asked me questions in the first video yesterday, and he straight up said there's nothing they can do because Houston particularly has a very strong mayoral position. And the way it works is when you go to speak at city council, they have agenda items. So today, they, the public session's on Tuesday, and today, Wednesday, they're actually voting on a bunch of items. So say it's like, hey, we have a contract for this. We're going to pass this bill. We're going to allocate this budget. You, if you come on Tuesday to speak about one of those agenda items, then you get to speak first, right? You're the first people you are on the agenda then those who are just not agenda who are just calling in to speak about whatever they always are placed afterwards which is why i had to wait two and a half hours to speak yeah. yesterday and by that point half the city council members are gone you know they because they don't have to stay there's that's what people don't realize there's no requirement that actually requires them to i think there's a minimum they have to be there every year or something but half the time most half the council members are gone they're talking to each other like it's very frustrating but either way um I, I, I'm going to keep doing those things. And I was there yesterday talking to Jack Christie about how strong the mayor is. And he basically said that you can keep coming, but until the mayor decides to put 5G on the agenda, then you're always going to be in, at the back. And we, and since it's not an agenda item, they don't have to give you comp. If you're actually there on agenda item, they are, you know, they are required to at least say, thank you for coming. Let me, you know, da, da, da. like, and it's, it, and it's honestly annoying because each council member, especially when there are cameras, they just want to be on camera saying, you know, you're from my district and I'm going to look into this and, but you know, it just, it's, yeah. it's, it's politics. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but I have no faith. And because of Houston's extremely strong mayoral position, nothing in this city can get voted on unless the mayor agrees to it. And that's why we've haven't been able to get rid of fluoride. The only way we were able to do things in the past, like kick out the TSA off the buses, is because we didn't have to get a vote. We went straight to Metro and put pressure on them. Yeah. So maybe we could put pressure on Verizon and try to get them to leave Houston, but they just had the 5G experience lab here in Houston for a week, and they had it in LA at the same time. And it's basically they chose like an empty warehouse here in Houston, and they put all their fancy devices in there and people could come in there and put on their virtual reality goggles and play football or play basketball or walk through the mountains and sit in a little chair that vibrated with them as they moved. Or, you know, they could play on their devices and they were like, look, everything in this room is powered by just this single 5G device, you know, and you don't have any lag. And then you ask them a single question about health or privacy and they're like, they haven't told us anything about that. No, but we can give you a free Apple TV if you sign up today. Yeah. You know, like right. that's, that's all they know is like, yeah. And so I don't have any faith that it's going to happen, that we'll be able to, I mean, I'm, I don't want to say no faith. I'm still trying. Obviously, I wouldn't be trying if I didn't think there was some way, but I don't think it's going to come through city council or at least not without an immense amount of pressure. So if anybody's seeing this and, and is concerned, even if you're not from Houston, we, you can send an email, you can make a phone call because it still puts pressure on them. And what I've been telling people is if Houston, the fourth largest city in the country, can even say, hold on, let's stop, let's put the brakes for a moment, let's, you know, because they never did a public health assessment, there was never a public comment period, there was never a vote, there was never any time for the people of Houston to say, these are my concerns, this is what, you know what I mean? The mayor literally just went and signed some deal with the head of Verizon, and that's what's going on, and now they're calling him the 5G champion of the, you know, wireless champion. But if people care, send some emails, send some phone calls. I'll send you the link to that. I actually wrote up a little brief template because I try to make it as easy as possible because I know how some people can be. And again, just express your concerns, whatever they may be. That can help us in some ways. Um, I don't know that they'll ever stop it through a vote, but perhaps we can at least put enough pressure on them that when the, when the next election comes, this becomes an issue, that people remember how they acted about 5G. That's the other thing, too, is I'm just trying to document this on the record that these people have been made aware that there are health concerns and privacy concerns. And if people get sick or we lose our privacy, then maybe in the future there'll be a class action lawsuit against them. So let me throw something at you, which I, I, I was thinking of, I, usually I would let something like this sort of go more on a health podcast, but I haven't done many of those lately. They, a couple things, first of all, so you know, I live in Los Angeles, so this 5G thing has been going on, you know, here too. I actually think that it's been online for already for quite some time, and they just are now telling people about it. Um, but you're all about finding personal solutions to these problems, right? Like what we can do as individuals, and I'm going to throw a wild one at you here. So I was playing with this theory for a long time because I'm really into health and nutrition, and um, last year I made a series of videos on the idea of sugar as programmable matter. And it kind of started me down a line of thinking about stuff. And one of the things uh, I look for, I do subscribe somewhat 
on a limited, because I think it's kind of a combination of things. I do subscribe to the possibility that we are living in a simulation yeah, on a certain level. And so I look for- I haven't ruled that out either. <laughs> I look for, for synchronicities and, and, and codes and things like that, right? And 5G, you know, another thing that they refer to as Gs is grams of sugar, right? Or grams of what you eat. And so I had this like idea in my head that like, oh, 5G, it like would somehow affect people who had more than five grams of available sugar in their body, right? In a different way than others. And think about how much there's sugar in everything now, right? Like there's just so much, an immense amount of sugar in everything. And, and you know, if you look at what sugar does, it's similar, it's crystalline and, so, and cubic and in its form, it's, you know, changes the behavior of people who consume it, right? It can hold information because of its, because of its structure. And so that was the basis of my videos, but I started to think, well, maybe a personal solution to this is, because I don't eat sugar, is to reduce your sugar consumption to a point where you're not affected by certain frequencies, right? So this was an idea I was playing with and mentioned. And then in one of my nutrition courses, because I'm studying you know, natural health and whatnot, I came across this paragraph that talked about how the natural state of people's blood, right, if they're not eating any sugar and junk food and stuff like that, is five grams of available sugar. So anytime they eat something, if they eat a candy bar, then it floods it with all this sugar and changes the state of their body for a certain period of hours until it's all processed through and then returns to the five grams, the five, five grams of sugar that sits there naturally. So wouldn't that be a brilliant coding of the matrix or the simulation, right? So the, a personal solution to this may be to not eat sugar. Obviously, when you eat any food, there is some amount of sugar in it. And it's going to raise temporarily. But why is it that everything we eat now is flooded with so much sugar? They want to make sure that people's bodies are constantly in that state of being above the natural amount of sugar that would be in one's body, which just so happens to be five grams, right? So a personal solution to this, folks, is watch your sugar consumption. Obviously, also be aware of you know things that heavy metals in the body and be doing things to chelate and get rid of that. But check your sugar consumption. And I have a feeling that people are going to be, who are not on the sugar, not, not on the programmable matter are going to be less programmed by these frequencies. So you just blew my mind. You, you just blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is really interesting. No, and, and, and I am totally with you on the possibility that this is a simulation. You know, this is like, that's one that I haven't been able to shake. And honestly, because of just what, what we know about the way our brain operates, which obviously is very limited from our perspective in Matrix, you know, it's it seems clear that there's so much of our reality that is being filtered out from us that, you know, what what we're perceiving is is just a small fraction of what's So remember going. when you were little and you played Pac-Man? You're a little younger than me, but I'm assuming you still played Pac-Man maybe when I you were younger, right? <laughs> okay. So the Pac-Man was running around in dark rooms, eating these pellets, listening to the same noise over and over and over again, kind of like the world that we live in, right? But the more pellets he ate, so he should be winning, the ghosts got faster. He didn't get faster, right? So the pellets are like sugar that keep people running around in the dark thinking they're doing something. And instead, it's increasing the rate at which the people who are after them can get them, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that I, you've definitely gone down a rabbit hole there that I haven't. I like that, though. Like you, So you said the like, kind of resting phase of a human is five grams of sugar, like, like for the body to have access to at any point. Like that's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I do think that, and this is an area that I'm aware of in other areas, but as far as 5G, I haven't uh, just, I haven't taken the time to go to go down to those layers because, you know, what I've tried to do with 5G is get people to, to even think about it and look at it. And as you know, like, there's so many things that we can't even get people to, like, they don't want to believe that their cell phones or any of this stuff could be causing harm to them, right? So mm -hmm. if I start off with, you know, this is a part of harp and they're probably frying your cells from within inside of you and they're activating the water water inside your body to slowly boil you as a population control method mm -hmm. or, you know, something along those lines, which again, I haven't ruled those possibilities out. Knowing everything mm -hmm. else I know, it kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. But I try not to start on that foot, especially with normies, you know what I mean? Like yeah. in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in a friendly way. Um, with those who haven't gone down various rabbit holes who would be just like, blow, you know, there's, it's funny how certain things in certain circles or conversations like this, I can say things like that. And it's like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, those, that's true. And other people would just be like, <laughs> this guy is, is nuts. You know what I mean? So I've, I've tried to take the, the route of with 5g starting super basic with people of what this issue is and um, I think for some people who are a little bit 
who already know what the real deal is, when they don't see me telling city council, stop trying to kill us, or you know, why are you yeah. trying to fry our brains? They, they don't think I'm going far enough. So I'm sure there are levels of this whole thing, including probably what you're talking about there, that, that, um, that not, only, that not only am I missing out on, but how do we get the, how do we get the, the mainstream person to go from yeah. 5G to let alone thinking that you know, there's five grams of necessary sugar in their, in their diet? Well, I mean, if we're in a simulation, then we're somehow characters in the game, right? And that what, how we would be programmed or controlled by, would be by the things that we consume, right? And how I started like, coming to this thing about the sugar was looking at the behavior of people who smoke vapes and found some interesting quotes from Tesla about that from way back before there was ever vapes. But then I started thinking, and you, know, you and I both know from our history that there's all sorts of designer drugs. Why wouldn't those be programmed? Why wouldn't there be code written into them to create certain sort of ideas, behaviors, patterns in people, aside from just whatever the, you know, like, yeah, obviously, you know, chemical reactions create stuff. But I mean, we're talking about designer drugs. Why wouldn't that be programming for, for certain things? And you often look at people who were involved in a certain thing when they were younger, and then they end up involved in another thing when they're later. Could that code have been, you know, written in by some of the things they consumed in that earlier phase of their life, right? So I have lots of yeah, wild, definitely, like, I definitely like that idea. Also, I think that another aspect of it is the epigenetic side of it. You know, totally. like trauma being imprinted and then that becoming a part of like the code, not only like the code of the matrix, but like your DNA code, which is probably the same thing. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's, there's a lot of layers to it. And I think that's probably one of the most scary things that I was actually watching uh, a, a documentary last night. I can't remember the title of it, but it was a some some somebody sent it to me because of this 5g topic actually and i was like well let me look into this and it it was very informative to me it gave you know i already know that there's evidence showing the dangers of these frequencies and a millimeter mm -hmm. waves particularly the 5g spectrum but the amount of information that's already available on how these frequencies affect cellular structure is mm -hmm. is just astounding Amazing. i mean it, yeah. It's crazy like that there's so much like information out there about and it's scary like it's it's pretty terrifying to think that like you know, I've started to unplug my Wi-Fi every night when I go to sleep yeah. now because just, you know, when you really think about it, like, what is the point? Why do I need Wi-Fi running while I'm trying to, like, sleep? And honestly, so I So that really, they can insert synthetic dreams. That's the reason why. I mean, <laughs> well, I definitely have slept better since then, yeah. is what I'm saying. Like, I have, I can honestly say, and that's just anecdotal, right? So take it for what it is, but give it a shot. Try it out if you haven't. If you've been running your Wi-Fi. I do it, yeah. Night, you know, and just, it's, well, it's been a lot better for me. It's been, like, Honestly, I never usually sleep all the way through the night. Like I'm a very light sleeper and I thought that was just the case, but honestly, I've been sleeping pretty heavy that I've been unplugging the, the Wi-Fi and sleeping a little bit longer. Usually it's just like I'm, I'm in this state of like half awake, half asleep where like, you know, I can hear my cat meowing outside. So I got to go get up and, you know, I just constantly getting up. But so anyways, my point is it's really astounding when you really see how much information is out there about how, um, you know, these things not only could potentially cause cancer, these different devices and, and the frequencies they're putting off, but uh, just the effect they're going to have on our DNA structure as well. I mean, we just have no idea what that's going to look like in the coming generations. And it's, Absolutely. that's, I think, probably the most terrifying aspect. Absolutely. So, all right. So we're a little about halfway through here. So do you want to, let's move on and uh, hit on some of this Jeffrey Epstein stuff a little bit. Um, you, you, you did a, you did a, a mini documentary, I'd say I first saw it pop up in my feed maybe two months ago, something like that around there. And then yeah. all of a sudden I started to see a lot more attention to him again. And then came this court case that a lot of people seem to think was a criminal court case, which was really a civil court case. Why did you suddenly decide to make, you know, you've spoken a little bit here and there about the pedophilia, about the Pizzagate stuff, but it's not usually been a main focus of the work you've done. What motivated you to suddenly decide to jump in on this Jeffrey Epstein thing? And did you kind of expect that it would have the effects that it did? So you're right that, you know, I've done, if you go search the website of the channel, I think I did, I did one video on Pizzagate a couple of years ago, just kind of like, hey, here's my take. Because typically my strategy is like with 5G, I hear about things for a while and I'll Wait. hear, you know, and I wait, I just kind of sit back, and especially when it comes to conspiracies, like, you know, I heard about Pizzagate for a long time, I kept hearing that phrase, just kind of, I didn't know what it was, but I just kept hearing that phrase until the point I'm like, all right, enough people that I know are mentioning this, that I need to look into this now. Same thing with QAnon and some of this other stuff. Uh, but I decided to get into it because towards the end of the tour, 
um, like I said, I was thinking like, well, what can I do locally when I get back to Houston? So 5G fit that, that sort of mold. But I was also wanting to move towards doing mini documentaries and more of them because I've done a few over the years with my partner that I'm working with. But I just see the amount of uh, views and traffic that people like James Corbett Report and others who are doing just quality reports. I mean, just well-researched and uh, graphically, visually very appealing and entertaining and that that's drawing people in. And so I started to think maybe that's the strategy I need to use to just draw in more viewers. And because I'm always, I'm, I'm very often told by friends, especially friends who have much bigger audiences than I do saying like, man, you, your channel needs more views or you should have more viewers. And, and I appreciate the support, but I also am like, okay, well, how can I, if people like the content I'm doing, how can I get more eyes on it? And I felt like maybe folks on the mini documentaries would be uh, uh, the, the way to go. And so I did one initially on surveillance that was back in September that called the modern surveillance state. And then once I was going on my East coast tour and I ended up in Florida, I can't remember exactly what it was that triggered that all these things were going on. But basically I started to, uh, I started to research this whole topic and I started to look at a cult called the finders, which is the current documentary I'm working on and Jeffrey Epstein and realize like, holy crap, like these things are all based in the Florida area. Can you and tell us about this cult called The Finders? Because I've noticed that 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 is showing up in the title of a lot of things that you're doing, The, yeah. the Finders, and it's not something I'd really heard of much before. Can you yeah. tell us about The Finders? Sure, sure. Uh, it's definitely one of the more obscure things, I think, in the conspiracy culture, you know, conspiracy research. Because I had, again, I'd only heard about it maybe two years ago. But if you do a search of The Finders cult on, on YouTube or any video platform, you're going to see a couple of videos. There are each three, four, maybe five, 10 minute videos, uh, 10, you know, 10 minute videos, but they don't really go in depth. But the basic story of the finders is that in 1987, there was two well-dressed men who were arrested in Tallahassee, Florida with six children who were described as disheveled, covered in bug bites, covered in scratches, who hadn't ate. And there were signs of potential sex abuse. So the men were arrested and taken in. And it was later revealed that they were part of a cult called the Finders, which was based in Washington, D.C. And then the D.C. police and the Customs Service and the FBI all got involved and they raided these warehouses that the Finders had. There was reports of pictures of naked kids. They had high tech equipment like this is 87. So they had broadband internet back then. They were using email back then. Like, I mean, they, they were using the earliest versions of it and they had maps of different you know, locations around the world. There was apparently instructions on how to buy children and, and instructions on impregnating the female members of the cult, just all kinds of crazy stuff. But within six days after making national news, and, and it was reported Washington Post, Associated Press, Reuters, all over the country, within six days, they made it disappear. And they say, well, we made a mistake, nothing to see here. There's no, you know, satanic activity. There's no pedophilia. There's no trafficking. There's no anything. And within a couple of months, they gave the kids back and the story disappears. And then in 93, all of a sudden it pops back up again. And it was reported that the Department of Justice was investigating whether or not the CIA had actually covered it up. But then again, within a week or two, like that kind of disappeared and it was never reported on again. So here we are now 30 years later. And as I start to research the Epstein stuff and Epstein's based down in Palm Beach, Florida, at least one of his homes is over there. He's got several of these. Um, the Tallahassee, Florida case was going on. I was headed to Florida for my East Coast tour. And my research just led me to... Jeffrey Epstein's house and led me to interviewing an ex member of the finders who was also still in Florida. And so I started doing this research while I was actually on the tour. I just hadn't announced it yet. And I wasn't really quite sure what I was going to do with it. But then once I got home and I had the time to sit down and actually, I had already, been, you know, had a folder of just files on Jeffrey Epstein and a folder with files on the finders. And it wasn't until about uh, September, October ish, where I started to really dive deep into these rabbit holes and, um, you know, I've always known that trafficking, human trafficking, sex trafficking, especially here in Houston, outside of the, the political aspect of it, it's an issue I've worked on here in Houston before. I have yeah. some, some ladies who help rescue kids off the streets of Houston, and I have done stories in the past for Mint Press News talking about the Houston Police Department turning a blind eye to sex trafficking. Like, I've been told things like that. So I've kind of always been concerned in it, and Houston is seen as like a hub for human trafficking because an international city with a port, a major airport, and not far from the border and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so I just decided to go deep into the, the Epstein stuff and that led to writing the script and doing the mini documentary. And basically, you know, I, I write the scripts and put out any notes I have for my editor. I go to the radio station that I, I have a show at and I record the audio and I send it to him and he makes it, you know, look amazing. 
And so we've been putting those out and we've got Bringing Down Jeffrey Epstein came out uh, November 1st. And yeah, it, it just seemed to be timely because I knew that his civil trial, which as you said, people kind of are misunderstanding what the whole trial was about. Um, I knew that it was coming up in early December. So I decided to put this, this documentary out in November. I didn't really think it was going to, I don't know, I was hopeful and it's definitely still growing even now, like right lately, just like I was saying with the 5G video, the 5G video and Jeffrey Epstein are kind of racing on my channel to see what's going to get more views, but they're both headed towards a hundred thousand views, which makes me very wow. happy because I want to expose both of these topics and I want to expose this man and the documentary is called bringing down Jeffrey Epstein because that's my goal. Like, and I think it should be the goal of all journalists who are focused on this and Bradley Edwards, who's the attorney, like there's a lot of good people who are actually trying to fight to expose this. And there's also a lot of corrupt people who helped him, you know, and, and mm -hmm. so these, these people are still in power, you know, so that's what we wanted to focus on in the documentary. Um, and I think that we've, we've done a good job so far. And thankfully, it just kind of timed out where there was the Miami Herald report and just several things going on in the trial. So his name has been in the, in the news and in the search engine. So it's sending a lot of traffic towards our, um, our documentary. My, my mind is doing wild things as you, as you talk about this, and I don't know that I can do justice to all the thoughts that are going on in my mind, sometimes it takes me a, a while to say, but have you, as you're continuing to look into this and hear things, really keep your eyes peeled for the connection between the sex trafficking and, and this kind of stuff and the pedophilia and its connection to the whatever, what, you know, to think programs like MKUltra and Mind Control right? Because they're, they're, they're very connected. I don't know if you're familiar like with what's been going on with the whole case with the gymnasts, with the Larry Nasser thing, and everybody's looking at this strictly as a sexual abuse and pedophilia uh, thing, which it is, and that shouldn't be discounted. But part of the reason why this is so buried is because of our own government's investment in mind control programs and sexual abuse being uh, a huge part of that. And as you're talking about this, my mind went to Julian Assange, right, who also grew up in a cult in, yeah. in Australia and who is, has, you know, there's a lot of evidence that he was part of whatever Australia or, you know, the, the men culture stuff is international. It isn't just an American thing, that he's been part of that. And then he is at the forefront of an organization that does a lot of tremendous amount of good work. And I think what they put out for the most part is proven to be largely true, but there does seem to be certain sort of agenda behind it. And that is where the emails that led to this thing about Pizzagate came from. Right. And so, you know, the person who is putting out a lot of these information has a background that where he was raised in a pedophilia sex cult kind of thing himself. Right. And so I'm just all of this weird. There's so much weird stuff that sort of um, collects around this issue of human trafficking and pedophilia and all this stuff. And, you know, Florida is also the hub of where we get a lot of these, I mean, half of these, you know, weird shooters and things like that come from, come from Broward County, Florida, or different areas in Florida. Um, you know, uh, lots of people, you know, our show focuses a lot on mind control and issues and lots of people who have backgrounds in that come from Florida. So, you know what I mean? It wouldn't surprise me if you found some connections with that kind of thing yeah, to that as well. And the way you're talking about the, there being a warehouse with all this high tech equipment, you know, way back in the eighties. Well, in those kinds of programs, that's where those, the, those technologies were first being, you know, used. In and so my mind's kind of, I don't know that I spoke clearly about all the things. No, no, you made all the good points. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate you saying that as about uh, Julian Assange because the interesting thing is, so the finders, they, um, I mean, it's a, it, I'm down to come back and talk about them alone on another show just because it's like such a big, Let's big topic. And the yeah. more I've looked into it, honestly, like, I mean, I just, I want people to please do check out our channel. The, the documentary is called who, who will find what the finders hide, which itself where that title comes from. I mean, you would love that rabbit hole, but it's like such an obscure thing that only people who've been down that rabbit hole will even recognize the title. But my point is that the finders, they used to be called the seekers. They, you know, were called the, they've had a bunch of different names and some people have tried to connect them to the family and some of the cults that Julian Assange was connected so my, to. I'm just like, I, I haven't got done the d deep dive in it, but my intuition is going that maybe what the finders, so I have this uh, theory and I've talked about it with others that, MK Ultra is and, and mind control programs are the local version of something that's been going on, you know, since the beginning of time. And it's about um, 
sort of finding and taking, finding people who carry a certain, either something in their genetics or a certain frequency or vibration to it that they've been tracking throughout incarnations. And in this local time, in this reality, the MK Ultra or, or these mind control programs are what sort of intercepts these people. And so they're not just looking for any child, right? Yeah, there's sickos out there that'll do yeah. stuff with any child. But my, my guess would be that the seekers or the finders are looking for very select people who for some reason carry some sort of genetic information, some, some sort of spiritual tie to high technology that is a spiritual or biological in nature, some sort of free energy kind of thing. And I don't mean free energy in terms of like powering devices. I mean, something that there's like a spiritual spark to them. Harvest. Yeah, right. So no, it's, it's interesting you say that. Look, I just want to throw one thing your way because this is something I haven't mentioned to anybody because the thing is I have like my script of all the stuff I found on the finders and at the bottom I have a list of just random things that like stick out in my mind that I'm like, I'm sure there's something to this. I don't know what it connects to, but it, I need to remember it. You know what I mean? And one of those things is, I don't know if you've looked into this. I can't remember the, the term, but there's a term for children who have uh, two different colored eyes or mm -hmm. have like one colored eye with like a you know speckle of other things mm -hmm. and have you ever looked into or heard and I, I i came across it recently but i couldn't find it again um i'm sure i can though if i look hard enough that it was about um the potentiality that these whoever are you know these networks that one of the things that they're seeking is like children specifically with discolored eyes because there's supposed to be some kind of like spiritual component to it right. well if you have to think there's any truth to that one of the children, if this is in the police reports, one of the kids that they had for, that the finders were caught with, that they were supposedly their kids, had discolored eyes. And it was noted in the police report. Yeah, so that, that came up also in that case with Madeline right, McCann because so she had some of that kind of thing going on her eyes. So yes, actually, a friend of someone else, a very good friend of mine who's also in the alternative media, um, we are in the background taping, taking a deep dive into the issue of eyes and how that relates to this. Um, a lot of people I know who come from projects and programs, including myself, have very interesting eyes. My eyes change colors. Like sometimes they're green, sometimes they're gray, sometimes they're blue. There's interesting things sort of going on inside of them. I have a theory that the pupil of the eye is actually a black hole, right? And, and, and you know, and, and there's things being able to be accessed through the way light sort of hits that in terms of mind control and triggering and whatnot. But yes, I do think that there is, um, I don't know if you ever saw the video that, um, Melissa Melton and, uh, and um, ah, I can't think of his name right now. Aaron. Aaron, Aaron Dykes did about the Oculus Society. Right? Yeah, Oculus, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, that was a good so one. There is, you know, back in Egypt, they had different people, like they had different eye doctors for, different, for each eye and the way the eyes relate to other systems in the body. Um, the eyes, in my opinion, and the way that light hits them is a key component in how uh, mind control works. Um, light spectrum control technologies, um, the connection, the, you know, there are colors outside of the spectrum that we normally see that have a lot of information attached to them. And people's right. ability I to have to tell you something then, because like, I'm just going to tell you where the name comes from, because I think you'll appreciate it, because it's related to MKUltra. It's absolutely related to MKUltra. These, mm -hmm. these are not only trauma-based, like, mind control programs, but like you're saying, the light. And I'll definitely explain this in, in, a, in, a, in a future interview we do about just the finders uh, yes. much deeper. But the, the gist of it is that videos that were posted anonymously online, which people have tried to connect to like, yeah, I don't know if you went down that Elsa gate rabbit hole about these like mm -hmm. Disney movies, you know, found with like weird stuff in them. But these certain videos that got posted anonymously online, for one, these videos were unlisted on a YouTube channel, right? The name mm -hmm. of the YouTube channel was Stuart Silverstone, who is one of the finders, who is mm -hmm. the name of one of the finders who is referenced in these old articles and who is apparently still a member of the finders. Underneath the YouTube videos were ciphers. And when people figured out the ciphers, they led to another video, led to another video, led to another video, yada, 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 about five or six videos. The videos themselves are flashing lights, mm -hmm. messages. They look exactly like yep. what we would expect in MKUltra. And honestly, I don't watch the whole thing when I went down the rabbit hole. And most people are saying, hey, like, I'm feeling weird about this. Maybe that's just whatever. But, you know, you want to be safe, right? Because you don't know what you, like yep. you said, what our eyes are taking in and what our yep. brains are taking in. You want to be careful, and and so, they're you know they're saying, uh, what it, there's a it says something like, uh, Little Mermaid is your trigger, 
Blue mm -hmm. is your trigger. Yep. Yellow, you know, and like just so people have followed them and it ends the final, you know, these lead from one cipher to one cipher to another video to a tweet to this, you know, kind of like the cicada stuff from years ago. Yep. And the final tweet, the final message says, who will find what the finders hide? Yep. So this is something, somebody either from within the finders or some massive troll. It doesn't seem like a troll to me though, because it's so obscure and there's only a few people who even have been down this rabbit yep. hole. But some of us, those who are kind of have, you know, oh, wow, we all ended up here, have kind of speculated that potentially this could be somebody from the finders trying to leak information, trying to, or mm -hmm. a victim of the finders. But it does seem for sure that they are still active in some I mean, think capacity. about it. If our DNA is like um, like a computer storage device, right? And somebody, if we're in a simulation or if we're in some weird kind of, mm, I, remove piece of time where something as funny is going on and they're trying to hide information inside like maybe there's information about something hidden inside of our dna and they're looking for it inside of the different people inside of people right and you know like certain kind of frequency whether it be sound or light you know and i have a lot of things to say about sound and light frequency is because of things i experienced as a child and then my later my involvement with dance music and what i think is you know partly going on there you know yeah i do think um you know, I'm having an interesting thing going on where I've been with a friend looking into certain ancient spiritual texts and observing the, the sort of visuals I have on the back of my eyelids when they're read to me. And what is being shown to me is a display of very high spiritual kind of technology that I intuitively understand, but that I don't have language for. And it all is based around light photons hitting things, right? And so, um, Derek, we're going to have to come back and just do, you know, a, a huge interview just about this where we can just get the, as weird as we want to and go down like every crevice of the rabbit hole on this because, you know, I, I, you know, you don't often talk publicly about things this weird, but I know you're a deep guy and I know that you're, you know, your mind works, you know, I, there's a reason why you and I have been attracted to some of the same things over the course of our life probably because yeah. we're searching for the same kind of answer here. Sure. And sure. it really is, I mean, all this outer stuff is really a distraction and it all really is sort of inside and there's people that know that and it's hidden within you know some people and some of these kids who've been involved in projects and programs you know when they are able to kind of come over on the other side they do have something really interesting to share you know what i mean and it's by people like you and i coming together and having these conversations that we're actually going to i think get somewhere with with this this is this is the really interesting part of the work <laughs> you know? yeah absolutely and you're right about that that you know there are um, there are conversations that I have at city council. There are conversations I have on camera and then there are the kind of conversations like sitting around talking with people or something like this, where I feel a little bit more, um, open to speak about things because yeah, when it, you know, if, the, if there's an article I'm putting out something that's meant for mainstream audience, I don't go down to these kind of levels. You know, like I said earlier, it's like how I, I'm having trouble even getting people to pay attention to the things that are right in front of them, let alone looking at those more esoteric levels. But we're talking um, about specs in people's eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love to go down those rabbit holes though, whenever the opportunity um, arises and, and uh, I'm down to come back again and talk for, you know, another, another time and get further into it. Is there anything else you wanted to me to, to focus on? Um, well, I just, before we, before we go, cause we're, we're winding up here. I just, you know, it's been about a year and a half since we last talked and, um, I, you know, you, last time I talked to you was when you were on your tour and then I got to go to one of the events and you did another tour this year. So you've been out there and sort of gotten to take the temperature of people and, um, you know, I, where do you think people are at? I mean, you know, like, you know, for people who haven't seen me with Derek before, check out his work. He's a holistic anarchist and his website is the conscious resistance. And I'll let him speak about some of that just before we go in just a minute. But, you know, I think for a lot of us who've been in this for a long time, maybe our idea of what freedom is is starting to change from uh, an external thing having related to trying to free ourselves from structures to really an internal thing as far as how we achieve freedom in our own minds. And, and, and maybe that's the more important thing to focus on. Where, what is the state? I mean, you spoke to people all over the country over the end of the summer. Where are people at? Do you think we are you know, evolving our ideas of freedom or do you think people are backsliding? I, I don't, I, sometimes it feels like it's not moving forward, you know, so I feel like people are either evolving their idea of it or they're sort of, you know, like we talked about before, backsliding into, you know, one side or the other or trying to, you know, go for small victories because they've given up on the big victory or, you know, whatever. So, you know, I think that there's, there's some of all those things that you just described, you know, um, 
for me, obviously at my events, like they, just because of the way I promote my work and the tour was called the, the liberate your mind tour. Right. So we visited 52 cities and we volunteered in about half of those. And I was really thankful for that. And some of these events included, you know, we had stops where literally maybe one or two people showed up in some of the small towns like Kansas and then some events, 30, 40 people and everything in between different backgrounds, ages, um, races, you know, ethnicities, all those different things, just such a wide spectrum, which is really interesting and appealing for me. And I love to see because I don't want to just feel like the people I'm speaking to are coming from one small cross section of society. You know what I mean? Like I want to reach as many people as possible. Um, and there were definitely some people who I had, uh, not hecklers, but I had some people come to there who were uh, telling me not to worry about things because QAnon's got things in the bag and everything's taken care of. They, who literally came to my stops and kind of had, we had a little back and forth and I'm like, all right, let's have that conversation after my presentation maybe because they just kept chiming in saying, don't worry, man, the good guys got it. Everything's okay. Because I was giving this presentation called the Pyramid of Power that kind of is a deep dive into the, you know, the whole physical situation. But of course, focusing on, like you were saying a moment ago, that the solutions outside of just opting out of systems and counter economics and agorism, things we've talked about in the past, but the solutions ultimately are just self-empowerment, like internal fulfillment and breaking away from these things mentally and spiritually, especially because when all this 5G crap comes live and goes on and they're literally trying to get into our minds, like if you're not, you know, if you're not the one that's like basically what I was telling a lot of people on the tour is like, this is the most important real estate. You know, this mm -hmm. is what they are trying to get in. This is John Trudell used to say, they're not only mining the planet for its resources, but they're mining our minds for our resources. And so you have to be the one that's going to be in control of that and, and know who you are and, and be able to reflect and connect with yourself and just be in control and power, you know, empower yourself internally. Otherwise somebody else is going to come in and fill that space. Um, and overall, I do think that there was a lot of hope among people. You know, there, there definitely are plenty of people who are speaking to me and saying, you know, hey, I'm in this situation. I see everything you're talking about, but I can't get out from under my mortgage or I got three kids or I got, you know, people are dealing with real life shit, you know, just trying to survive for a lot of people. And that is what this system is designed to do is to keep us running in the rat race so that we don't even have a moment to stop, to connect ourselves, to think these deeper questions, to ask these uh, you know, to talk about these bigger topics and to go within. So in some ways, there are plenty of people who are, you know, victims of the system that's currently existing. And maybe they try to escape that for a night. So they come to one of our events and they participate in a meditation, they volunteer, they hear, hear me give a presentation and they, they come. Sh I mean, I had a lot of people just truly open up their hearts to me and say, this is what I'm dealing with. And you'll appreciate this. I mean, on tour, I don't think I've met outside of prison, I don't think I've met as many former addicts and people who are recovering from suicide. And mm -hmm. I, it really did just kind of side note here. It really did make me understand the importance of us creating our own support systems. And, you know, I have a video coming out soon about freedom cells as support systems, because, wow. you know, when you get, when you get out of prison, when you get off drug addiction or recovery and whatever way it may be, depression, addiction, various kinds, if you don't have a support system, I mean, it can be very difficult to deal with and process these things. And, um, and I met so many people on tour who were like, Hey man, I heard you talk about your drug addiction before I'm six weeks clean or, you know, I just got out from the, you know, and, and just, I'm talking about over and over again, or people said like, I also tried to kill myself. Hey, I also struggle with depression. And that was a big takeaway for me too, just to see how many of us are hurt out there and like, and are dealing with trauma and are processing this trauma. So I think that that's really where the key is, you know, to me, the Epstein documentary, the finder stuff and digging down those rabbit holes in 5G, those are all important and relevant because they're going to affect us in the physical realm. And, you know, that, that's a part of our healing, too, is confronting these yeah. this darkness that exists in us. But if we only do that without also working on our own stuff and, and kind of trying to, to heal our, our traumas and our wounds, then, you know, as you know, as we've talked about before, we're, we're not going to get where we're, we want to go, I don't think. Show people your shirt. Yeah, so the shirt says, the shirt says uh, it all. Yeah. Revolution without healing is a rescue for disaster. Yeah. And that's from the first book, The Reflections on Anarchy and Spirituality. But it's definitely something that I tried to promote and live by because I know that myself is somebody who's a flawed human being and struggled with suicide attempts and depression and drug addiction and prison and, uh, you know, uh, just struggling to be a good human being in general and all the flaws and all the guilt and all the, you know, self forgiveness and, and you know, interpersonal relationships, everything that comes along with being in this beautiful, crazy world that we live in. 
it's a lot, you know, it's a lot. And the more that we can do to help each other and support each other in, in this world, I think that's going to go a long way to getting us to where we want to be, especially as we face these tumultuous times that um, I do see coming in the next couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I mean, it, 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 it it's, you know, it's a lovely thing to try and fix the world outside, but if you haven't done the work on yourself, it's, you know, you usually end up sort of making a bigger mess. It's really important that you start inside, you know what I mean? And that that be a continuing process. And if you're not working on it on the inside, you might want to check yourself on what you're doing on the outside. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's just what's key to remember is, you know, we can, the, the rabbit holes are interesting. The rabbit holes can be fun. They can be entertaining. But when you find yourself going down these various rabbit holes and research, uh, researching these topics and you find yourself feeling isolated or depressed or alone or just heavy and just weighted down, then it's time to step away. It's time to recharge. It's time to you know, maybe unplug from the devices a little bit or go spend some time like doing whatever it is that you love to do. Like I, I have to go take daily bike rides because that's what keeps me sane. You know, I'm yeah. just unplugging off. The I computer, exercise a lot riding. too. Yeah. Yeah. Going to the gym or going to just exercise and just, you know, releasing and just doing something that can kind of put you in that zone, in your flow state, whatever that means for different people. And, you know, make time for those things because that's, what's going to help you in the long run. And, Absolutely. uh, that, you know, I, yeah. Be conscious of what you put in your body, what you do with your body. Absolutely. And, you know, be, be, yeah, absolutely. Derek, as always, it's an amazing conversation. Please, let's, do, let's, let's make a point of making, you know, we can, do a, we can do a full show. Like, usually we do a two-hour, you know, one for the, for the public, one for the patrons. We can dig deep into some of the weirder aspects sure. of what you're finding with the finders. I would love to do that with you. And that might be something we could even, you know, you can put it on your channel. We can use that, you know, to kind sure. of for the, yeah, also, um, this is an amazing conversation. Before we go, let people know what you're up to and where they can find you. Sure. So the consciousresistance.com is going to be the place to always find me. One thing I'll say on that is I am uh, still committed at the moment. We'll see if things change, but I'm still committed by January 2019 to no longer posting new content on YouTube, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, uh, whatever other ones exist out there. All the BS and, nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. Use, I'm going to use <clears throat> BitChute. I'm going to use Steemit. I'm going to use Minds.com and MeWe. Those are the kind of alternatives I'm focusing on as well as my own website. I have a, you know, an email newsletter. I've got a text update list. I've got a Telegram channel. There are so many alternative ways to follow my content without supporting companies that don't give a damn about us and that literally go against the values that we support. So I will be found on those places, but always at theconsciousresistance.com. The Finders documentary should be out within a week or two at the most. And uh, maybe after that, we can we can talk again and, and absolutely about the documentary and go deeper into it. Sounds great, Derek. Uh, thank you so much. And I always enjoy our conversations. We'll have you back very soon. And for everybody else, the truth is out there. It's inside of you. We'll see you next time. Have a good one. Oh, no.